Hi, everyone. If you are just joining in, my name is Michelle LeBlanc, and we're going to get started at 1 o'clock. But I wanted to just get everybody situated. And if you are joining us just now, to put up a couple of links. So we are going to be talking today all about bending lines. And at the bottom here, you can see there is a link to the online exhibition. And we're going to be looking specifically at education activities. So if you'd like to join in, we're actually going to go and look pretty close in at some of the maps in the show. And I will be putting them up on the screen today, but you may uh, want to zoom in on your own. We're going to ask you for your participation today in the comments section. So if you'd like to go ahead and put that link into your browser and join us in the exhibition, there's a lot of amazing material there. We're only going to scratch just a tiny bit of the surface of that today and see where we can uh, get and you will have many hours to spend in this exhibition. There's great material there. So if you're just joining us, we're gonna start really shortly. Our live tour starts at 1 p.m. And glad to have you here, those of you who are joining us. If you are educators, I imagine maybe you are um, taking a break from teaching online today, or you don't have to be on Zoom today with your students, or you're just really excited um, about maps. Either way, whatever your reason for coming here today, really glad to have you. And we are at one o'clock, so I'm gonna get us started. Um, so welcome, those of you joining us today. My name is Michelle LeBlanc. I'm the Director of Education for the Leventhal Map and Education Center. And maybe some of you have been there before. We're um, hoping someday soon to be back in our physical space, but we are inside of the Boston Public Library located in Copley Square. And we have a beautiful gallery. And one day, uh, Bending Lines, hopefully this fall, will be physically available to view. But fortunately for us, we have this amazing online resource that was created by our staff, um, and very specifically also by our curator, Garrett Nelson. And many of you may have been tuning in to some of the live talks that have been happening on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. So this is in addition to that. And again, we want to highlight the education work that went into this exhibition and some of the amazing resources that can be used for educators. So I'm gonna put it up once again, those of you just joining, I would encourage you to open up in your browser the link to the exhibition. It is expansive. I will say there's just a lot here and I encourage you again on your own time to look through the rest of the exhibit but we will be zooming in today on a couple of specific maps and thinking about how we use them with students. So um, my colleague, Lynn Brown is here as well. She's our education coordinator. She's going to be uh, in the chats of both YouTube and Facebook. So she'll be joining us as well. And we encourage you to participate today. We would love to hear um, from you in the comments section. And I'm actually gonna be asking you some questions as we would students looking at a couple of these maps. So please feel free to add those in and any questions you have going along. We'll have some time at the end today to answer those. So just some quick background on the MAP Center. We are the caretakers for the collection of the Boston Public Library. Uh, we're in a public-private partnership with them. The collection is about 200,000 maps and 5,000 historical atlases. We also have created a number of digital interactives um, pertaining to our maps, namely our newest, something called Atlas Scope, which I encourage you to check out. You can find that on our website. And it is a way to explore some of our urban atlases. We, um, as a map center, we think about the ways that maps tell us about the relationship between people and places and these geographic perspectives. So how do we approach subjects in the classroom uh, through geography? So geography, not just being the study of places, but thinking about the interconnections um, and I hope that we do have some geography teachers today who can chime in on this. And those of you who are looking to use more maps and think about the, the wide cross connections that geography can make, um, this is a good place for you to be. We work uh, largely with the Boston Public Schools, although of course schools across Greater Boston um, and with our materials, of course, across the nation. We serve around 4,000 students a year physically uh, in their classrooms and in our space in the Boston Public Library. And we also provide professional development for teachers using maps in the classroom and also using GIS. We're gonna talk a lot about GIS and data mapping today. There's a lot of that in the show. 
And we helped students in Boston high schools actually use JS data to expand on topics that um, they are looking at in their city, ways that they want to make their city better and systems um, that are part of our lives right now. Um, I'm gonna put up also, if you'd like, we have a great educators page on our website. So you can find out more about our programs, about um, our materials. We have a number of lesson plans and map sets pertaining from everything to the mapping of indigenous lands, um, we have a new lesson called Youth, uh, about getting out the youth vote called Why Vote that incorporates different maps um, and graphs and visualizations. And at the end of that, we're trying to get students to register to vote right here in Massachusetts. And if you're in another state, of course, you can sub in your own voter registration forms. So do take a look at those resources. Um, so our goals in this hour, uh, I want to introduce Bending Lines to you, this amazing exhibit, and think about how you could use it as an educator. And I also want to frame how we in the MAP Center think about and talk about maps as objects, as primary sources. And we often say maps have a very um, reputation for being somewhat trustworthy. And is that is that something that they have earned? Not necessarily, and Bending Lines explores so much of this in great depth, but we have winnowed down some very essential resources for educators and for students to use that we hope will be useful today. We want students to come away from our programs and from our work um, with these maps to being critical readers of maps. Um, we have two lessons that I will walk you through today, and then again, like I said, we'll look closely at a couple of the maps on our education tour. And at the end, we will have some time for questions. All right, so bending in right here. I'm gonna put myself a little bit smaller. Um, so bending lines, maps, and data from distortion to deception uh, explores the many ways in which maps bend reality, hence the name bending lines, and how they give us pictures of the world that sometimes seem like they are more real than reality themselves, and how cartographers um, come at these maps, sometimes in more subtle ways and sometimes in more overt ways. Um, and just putting the link up again, if anyone is just joining us now, if you wanna go ahead and log into Bending Lines, you'll be able to follow along. I wanna emphasize upfront also, we're not going to be going in depth in this section today, but there are a tremendous number of maps in this exhibit that are particularly, particularly poignant for this moment in time that address systemic racism um, and looking at these larger systems. And one of them I wanted to highlight for you just now is in a section that is called the power to make belief in the exhibition. So this map um, that you'll see here, some of you may be familiar with it, it was done by the Southern Poverty Law Center and it is actually looking at Confederate um, monuments, place names across the country. So things like courthouses and schools um, are included on this map, just to zoom in a little bit more for you there. You can see that it includes everything from flags and trails and things like that. Um, so since we are in a moment, of course, not just um, Confederate statues, but statues of Christopher Columbus, this is a map that is updated um, frequently and an interactive map that might be a good one to use with students. In this section, uh, another example is a great map by um, Margaret Pierce, who is a cartographer. She is an indigenous person herself, and she has created several maps, the one we have in the show, is on a map of Canada that has been mapped through um, native place names. And she actually worked with native communities to consolidate all of those names. So it's a pretty it's, um, amazing map. And she has done one for Maine as well. So you can see a little bit more about her work. I'm gonna go ahead and open up for you uh, the main landing page that you would use uh, as you look for educational materials, just to give you a, an overview of what we're gonna look at today. And the materials that have been designed for this site were created for students in grades three to 10. Uh, we kind of hit a wide span, but I think there's something here for everyone and everything can be adapted um, for higher or lower grades. And we do in the WAP Center work with children as young as even first and second grades who are just beginning their map basics. So there's even some really wonderful map examples here that you could think about with younger students. So this is the lay of the land, so to speak. We have um, an education tour, which we're gonna set out on in a few minutes and look at a few specific maps. 
We also created a very specific section called Mapping Children in Boston, or the Geography of Youth is another name for it. And this is a collection of three maps, one of which is a, an original map uh, that was created just for the show. So we're gonna walk through that briefly. And then at the end here, you will see that there are two lesson plans. Uh, one is on data mapping, and it, and it pertains to these maps of children in Boston. And we also have one on map projections. And I want to emphasize, again, a lot of our uh, lessons and things do have maps about Boston in them, but they are certainly not specific to Boston. These are just the samples that we use since we do have a strong relationship in working with Boston Public Schools. You will see that there's an introduction for educators. So if you get a moment later on, you would definitely want to start there. And just to read a bit of that introduction, we're helping you think about how you start talking about maps. If, you're, if you don't use maps to teach very often, you may use them in a way to show students locations and kind of think about them as like where things are. But this is um, text taken right from the show that I just wanna excerpt for you briefly. Maps, truth, and belief have a complicated relationship with one another. Every map is a representation of reality and every representation, no matter how accurate and honest, involves simplification, symbolization, and selective attention. Even when a map isn't trying to actively deceive its readers, it will still reduce the complexity of the real world, emphasizing some features and hiding others. So this is a little more nuanced. You may hear people say, oh, well, maps lie. There's actually a book called How Maps Lie. Um, we prefer sometimes a more nuanced view. There certainly are examples in the show of very bold maps that are making a strong case for something, but um, thinking about how the, there's a purpose behind that map and what kinds of tools did the cartographer use to tell their story and how might you also step back and say, well, what am I seeing here uh, that I could sort of pick through and what other information do I need to know? And we want students, of course, to be doing this, to not trust these documents. Just thinking about some framing too for younger students. When we talk about maps with our littlest ones in those early grades, we refer to maps as stories. So how do we think about them um, with an author and how are they telling you, they have a, a story to them, they have a purpose, right? So they're about something. So getting students to start thinking about, oh, well, this is made by a human being and you know they are coming at this from a certain direction. With our older students, we are using terminology like purpose, perspective, um, bias. What kind of knowledge did the map maker have? There are older maps in this collection. Maybe the map maker knew a lot about um, the coast of New England, like John Smith, and they made up place names, but maybe they didn't. They also may have been huge gaps in their cartographic knowledge as well. So we're gonna jump in. Uh, I'm gonna start us off with our education tour, and I just wanna say a few words about this that the tour is actually not uh, in any way encompassing all of the maps in the exhibition, but we selected ones that we thought were particularly good to set up a lot of the big ideas that are uh, a part of the show. And again, this language and ways that we talk about maps with students. So you'll see the ones uh, that I selected today, we'll talk about a few of those concepts. You'll also notice uh, we have this lovely, we call her the spinning girl. She's actually an azimuthal map. So she is featured in uh, a World War II map in our squashing the globe section on projections. She originally was wearing kind of a globe skirt and then she spins and it talks about how the earth kind of splays out as she is a ballerina, but she is our mascot for the day and we follow her around the exhibit. So as you click on each of the green box, the education tour will jump you around uh, in the exhibition today. Again, these captions were written for a younger K-12 audience um, and they have specific questions in them pertaining to the map. So instead of kind of you know walking us through all of the maps today, which would be an awful lot to do, I elected to set a theme today and I decided that transportation was a pretty good one. So we're gonna look at three different maps in our education tour that connect to, to transportation. And our first one, if you wanted to look for this in the exhibition, let me just put my, yep, you've got the link there, just making sure. And I'm gonna put this down here as well. So if you have comments and things as we're going along. Um, so I'm gonna ask you a few questions about this map. So this is the education tour. You'll see the boxes here. 
You will also notice that there are highlighted words. So we have created a glossary that you will link those words. So if we need to define things like what is a choropleth map, as we'll get to one of those later on today, but everything as simple as um, what the census is, but also color and some of the definitions. So how do we think about color on maps? So just be aware of that. There's a lot um, to look at there. And in this particular map, you'll also see that there are some questions for students. So they are designed for a student to be going through on their own. So I'm gonna zoom in here. I'm actually going to move us over into full screen for a moment. So maybe you can see a little bit better. And just a few questions that I want to pose to our audience today, and you can dump these right into the comments section, are um, as you're looking at this map as best you can see it, if you're able to pull it up um, in the exhibition and zoom in a little bit, what was your eye drawn to on this map? And what do you see the map maker doing to make their point? And while you're kind of looking at that, I'm just gonna give you the briefest of background on this map. Uh, it was made in 1918. And it was in fact created by the National Highways Association. This map in real life, by the way, is enormous. It is really um, quite a, a mammoth map. You can even see kind of the folds here. So I'm wondering, um, what is your eye drawn to? out there in our audience land. What do you see on here that our map maker is doing? What are they adding? What have they, what kind of techniques have they used to, to make their case here for this 1918 highway map? I'll give you a moment to look through. I'm gonna zoom in on a couple of things here as we're looking around. So we have um, this really fascinating section here that says nationalism. We have some comparisons. Um, true patriotism means uh, sacrifice and self-denial, but lip patriotism, selfishness and greed. So I'm seeing in one of our comments, uh, we have a comment that says Uncle Sam and preparedness. So yes, we see a lot of giant words about preparedness. Let's go back out to the top here. Right, two giant words. So one thing to think about too is the color on the map. Uh, also seeing Uncle Sam, what is he doing here? So here he is in the lower corner and underneath him, it says question of questions, arm or disarm. And over here on the side, there are a lot a lot of names around this map. Um, we have departments and divisions of highways. We also have um, over here on the other side of this map, the names of the supporters of this plan, of course. Let's go back over here. Apologies for my somewhat slow moving around here. There we go. The Council of Governors are on here. Any other thoughts that people see? I see certainly the national symbolism on here is big. And what does Uncle Sam have to do with the building of highways? An excellent question, right? So some of the things we ask students to think about are the ways that maps, again, tell their stories. And this one is kind of throwing everything, uh, including the kitchen sink here, from color, I think there's probably about 85 fonts that are being used on this map today. The map itself, as you're noticed, is kind of a snoozer. It is, you know, a simple map of the US, but it's showing this entanglement of highways um, with places. Uh, but then not only illustrations, Uncle Sam and this somewhat questionable scene that's going on over here. And then we have at the top, also some photographs as well up here in this corner. So this is a great example of a, a map that is telling us a lot of stories with a lot of techniques. And students can kind of walk through that, but picking up on the nationalism of the map, it is definitely hitting you over the head with a bit of a hammer today. Um, some background on this map too is that the map maker was actually in the construction business and had 
deep connections to Henry Ford as well. And this sort of nationalist connection here, the idea of preparedness and national defense, this being right um, at the era, end of World War I. Um, did all of these highways happen would be another question. Like, did this plan actually proceed ahead? We know that um, later on, as you read the fuller caption, you can read a lot more about the map um, in the main part of the tour here, that there, the national highways system of interstate and defense highways did not happen until after World War II into the 1950s. But this is an early iteration of that and this idea of um, preparedness and defense being part of this map too. So this is a great one uh, to use with students. Again, if, especially if you're teaching 20th century history, it's a good place to begin. Uh, with maps, and it certainly has a huge message to it. I want to move on to two other maps that are also connected to transportation. Go back here for just a moment and show you as you're moving through the exhibit, there is also a really fantastic section. I'm going to back up here where um, we asked several cartographers to create original maps for us. I guess you could say bespoke maps uh, as part of the exhibition. And this was an attempt to talk about, again, every map has a purpose. So how do cartographers tell their story? And especially in this era of data mapping, how can one set of data be manipulated and shown in a variety of different ways to tell very different stories? Um, as a, an aside, one of the things that we do with our high school students is look at a lot of data maps about Boston as part of our uh, Maptivist program. And we look at a lot of census data. We also have a lesson that we recently did that showed um, rates of COVID by neighborhood in Boston. So asking students, what does that tell you? What does it not tell you? So the ones that I selected today, there's some really great examples. This particular one is uh, two transportation stories. So I'm just going to zoom in on this first map. I want to show you the title. And this is by a cartographer named Andy Woodruff, who is actually at um, Axis Maps, which is in Cambridge. Sorry about that. My map is not agreeing to load up with me today. Here we go. Let's see if I can get it to come. There we go. Just taking a second. So as that is loading, this is a map of public transportation in Boston. I'm gonna zoom back out again. Sorry, everybody, there we go. So public transportation routes in greater Boston uh, served by the Massachusetts Bay Authority. He's got some distances here. We have a great explanation. One of the fun things about this map that Andy created is that it has this old fashioned map feel. These feel like the maps from the 19th century that we have in our collection at the Map Center. So we have some symbology um, that is dealing with light rail and commuter railways and omnibus routes, for example. We also have over here some great insets. So I love that he has referred especially to this bus as the trackless trolley, for example, or MBTA bus here. So this map shows us, again, just the, the all of the transit lines, and we can see that they all are kind of converging right here into the middle of Boston. So now I want to show you a second map. I'll give you just a second to look through it. If you are following along here, we are again um, in the section of the exhibition called um, How to Bend Data Stories. So if you wanted to find this map and look at it a little more closely. All right, so here we go. This is our second map that Andy created. So he also had the same set of transportation data, as you'll see here. And just to zoom in a little bit on the bottom of this one. So this one is entitled The Great Transit Desert. So he uh, outlines here for us that 1.3 million people live within a 10 minute walk uh, or live in the Boston area and who are further than a 10 minute walk from the subway and light rail stations. So in this particular map, you can see here we have uh, a lex an explanation for subway lines and also this kind of brick wall denotes the 10 minute walk from one of those stations. And then as we go over here, you can see that he has arranged 
population. So these kind of taller skyscraper looking buildings are 100 people and the single family looking house is only 10 people. So as we kind of zoom in, here we are down in Norwood, Massachusetts, we'll kind of come into our area of Boston where you would have those subway lines. Here we go. So we're coming up into Hyde Park and Mattapan. So you can see that this almost feels like this wall that's being built right around these subway stations. And then everyone else is kind of on the outside. So some of the questions that we are asking students here to think about with these maps are how does how do each of these maps make you feel about public transportation in Boston? And what ways does the cartographer use to make you feel that way? And so I'm wondering what you think as you looked at the two of those. Is there any uh, observations that you made between the two of them in our chat? Please feel free to join in. I think just, um, as I'm looking at them alone, the, the titles are really brilliant. I think Andy has a particularly great um, style. It's almost kind of comic-y style in the second one with the buildings. But it, it also goes to show you that titles on maps can have very uh, powerful influence over us. Just by reading that title alone, we're already predisposed to think a certain way about the map. So we have to really dig in deeper to understand for example, that Andy also has not included in this map those omnibus lines, right? So there's a lot of difference between even sort of, did he use all of the data between these two maps? So within this caption here for students, um, you have the two maps and then these questions for students. And also this great question that my colleague wrote that I really love, can both of these stories be true at the same time, which I think is a really particularly poignant uh, question to think about. So can it both be that we have a really robust public transportation system in Boston, but also that there are a lot of people who are underserved by public transportation and are there ways to improve upon that? So these are great conversation pieces for students to use as we talk about bigger issues um, and using these maps to foster that conversation. All right, I'm going to move us into this other section over here, which is back into our educator landing page. And again, we have our tour and the second piece here that we have is our mapping children in Boston section. So I wanna show you, we're really excited about this. Someday, um, if you come into the map center, <laughs> there will be these maps to be seen up on, um, in a case and it will have its own sort of children's section. But we created these so that we would have a way to talk about data mapping um, for the level of students. And this geography of youth section uh, covers the idea of data again. Uh, how does data, how, is it, how do cartographers use it in their maps and how can the same data again, same idea as Andy Woodruff's map be used in different ways. So there are three maps in this section. The first one is, they are all about children in Boston. So this first one is a 1948 map about children's playgrounds in Boston. It comes from a larger report where they were in fact actually studying uh, to think about where they should be placing more playgrounds. And this is also kind of a nascent playground movement where they were moving away from sort of splintery wooden swing sets and into more, uh, engaging sorts of playground equipment. So on this map, um, there are dots that represent 25 children, ages zero to uh, 15, I believe. And then the red areas are school playgrounds and the green areas are sort of park-like playgrounds. So this is telling us one kind of story as we look at these highly concentrated areas like around um, Dorchester. But in 1948, there were more children period uh, in Boston. As we scroll down, we have a second map that uses census data from 2010. So this is the Cora Pleth map that I mentioned earlier, and it uses color to tell its story. So gradations of color. And you can see in the legend here that the darker the color, the more children there are. And today, if you're familiar with the neighborhoods of Boston, areas like Roxbury and Dorchester, some parts of East Boston have 
higher concentrations of children than any other part of the city. So we can see that kind of arrayed really well with the census map. And then finally, we're really excited about this map. It's actually was created for uh, this exhibit and it was created by an illustrator named Raul III. You may be familiar with some of his work. He has uh, a really several great comic graphic novels, uh, one called Low Riders in Space, that's just fantastic, and artist Elaine Bay. Um, so this is actually the same kind of data. It's the census data plus some American community survey data from 2018. And they created this caricature map called Boston Kids Count. And it's the same idea, kind of this core pleth idea, but a totally different way of thinking about geospatial data in this caricature form. So it's quite adorable. We also have a coloring page. Um, so if you're interested in uh, receiving that, we could totally send this to you. My own children have been enjoying it as well. So if you have kids at home, this could be a great way. So this is the section. There are lots of great questions here. And I point this out because these are great maps to talk about um, data, but also because they tie right into, I'll put myself back on here. They tie right into our first lesson that I wanna talk to you about. So we have two lessons connected to the show. The first one is called Kids Count, Mapping Children in Boston. And this lesson is, again, incorporating those three maps that you saw earlier. So we are helping students understand what geospatial data is. And we have an array of different uh, terminology here that are important for students to use. The main one being geospatial data, because this may be the first time that students have ever heard this term. We wanted to focus on these three maps and also this idea of what is being collected by the US Census and how also the American Community Survey, the importance of the census, and then how so much of the census uh, and the American Community Save Rate is also um, estimates, right? So these numbers are not necessarily the exact numbers and how do we maybe kind of think about that as we think about maybe where there could be some errors. So there's some explanation here. Um, and I wanna back up to say that these lessons were originally designed to be done in the MAP Center, just like uh, those of you who are teachers out there in the audience, I'm sure you are missing seeing your students in person. Uh, my colleague and I really do desperately miss seeing students ourselves. And we had designed this thinking that we would be doing it with kids uh, coming into our gallery space and into our learning center. So we had to re sort of adjust our brains to think about how could this lesson be done, uh, A, by students on their own in their home, and also potentially by a teacher who would assign certain aspects of this. So it's it has been designed to be able to be taught in a virtual environment. So as we scroll down, one of the things that we are talking to students about is again, what is geospatial data? And for some, they have never, you know, sort of seen what does that mean? What does data look like? Just to zoom in a little bit more here. We have a chart here that's actually showing the data that was incorporated into those maps of kids in Boston. And we can see that they're by census track, for example, and these estimates for the number of kids. There's also a whole column of margin of error. So for our uh, data folks out there, certainly some of these census tracks have, you know, like this one here, has a pretty high margin of error. So going into a little bit of detail about what does that mean? What does it mean to estimate when you're doing something like a census? And how is all of this collected? I, th I think uh, my colleague and I also talk a little bit how important it is to talk about all of the ways that data is collected on all of us all of the time. Um, if you have a cell phone, you're constantly being pinged somewhere. And some of those, uh, certainly the, the issues, right? Societal issues around collecting data. But what does it mean in general? How can it be really amazingly powerful and useful? And also how can it obviously has, has dangers and, and discussions that we have to have about that. So we have um, underneath the data, we talk about the purpose of maps. This is again, a big theme throughout the show. Every map has a purpose, right? Some of them stronger than others. And the cartographer has to think about what that purpose is before they go into it. That's what makes the map that much stronger. So they might, like our highways map we looked at from 1918, decide this is a map about patriotism. 
So I am going to uh, make sure that I use lots and lots of bold colors there. So one of the ways that we ask children to start thinking about purpose is if they needed to figure out where kids are in Boston, here are some great, great questions to ask. Um, why would you need to know this? Why would you wanna know where kids are in Boston? Why would you wanna collect this kind of data? So we imagined that kids might come up with answers such as where to build schools or playgrounds, but maybe you wanna talk about ice cream truck routes. Um, maybe you wanna talk about where to open a toy store and doing this brainstorming to think about why does data about children matter and how can it help a city uh, do something? And then, that there are lots of different ways to show data. So we've looked at maps. Hopefully the students have gone through the education tour and have kind of looked at these ideas of color and the different ways that the maps are showing information. So again, this lesson was designed to start to think about how we might um, sit down on the floor with students and ask them to show us how would you represent 100 kids? So doing this in person would be a lot of fun because we could get the kids on the floor with a big roll of paper and ask them to work together in groups. And how many different ways, using pictures, using colors, using symbols, um, numbers, What? how many different ways could you actually show the number 100 kids? So this brainstorming will get us to start thinking about, again, the, how we show data. And then asking students to um, think about what, how would you then create your own map? And so the last piece of this lesson is to have, and again, this is designed for the home, um, for the homeschool child, but you could go out uh, to your street and start to count different colors of cars and think about the ways that, um, how many different colors cars or out of state license plates, for example. You could take a patch of your lawn and note where the different dandelions are on the lawn and count those up to create your own data set. You could even um, you know, use something inside of your house, a room or map out all of the electrical outlets in the room. So collecting this data and then decide, what am I gonna do with this data? What do I wanna know? Do I want um, to create a great closed street in my neighborhood where kids can play? So are we going to create an underground parking garage? There's too many cars on the street and then to map that out and create kind of a persuasive map that would help tell that story. So this is um, a lesson, again, that can get at these kind of very high level concepts of data and mapping, but on a very tangible level for kids and it, that allows them to really think about um, how maps can have this persuasive element in their lives and how every day they could co be collecting their own sets of data. And my colleague has put up, um, that uh, the MAP Center is happy to find maps for you that have data sets in them. So some of these, again, uh, pertain to Boston if you don't teach in Boston, but you're really interested in thinking about how you could do this lesson in your geographic area. We have um, amazing librarians, uh, great educators too, but our librarians know all sorts of sources and all of us as a team are more than happy to help you find items. And I'll put my, our contacts up at the end today here. So that is lesson number one. Uh, again, there are the three maps. We do ask students, you know, talking about those, talking about these particular ways that they each tell their, their uh, story. All right, I'm gonna pause here and just see if we had any other questions. I see one that would be great. It would be, let me go back into our comments here. Thank you for your patience. There was a great one up here. I'm gonna put this one up. Uh, it would be interesting to overlay the second map with one of playgrounds in those areas, then wonder about equity and outdoor play. Yes, absolutely. So, so much of this data is about equity, right? So as we look at um, access and thinking about the two transit maps as well, um, and how these ideas of access can be very different. Is a bus the equivalent of a subway line or a commuter rail line? A lot of people say no, right, with traffic. Um, so we start to get into these bigger issues of equity. Um, I also like this comment a lot. I love how the caricature map makes use of audience and includes kids in the conversation with an entertaining image. Yeah, um, the caricature map is really fantastic. If you can't see it, you should definitely go onto the site and zoom in. The some of the kids are actually drawing the kids in the middle in Boston. So it's, it's a map that's making itself on the inside. I don't know if that makes sense, but it sounds like it does. <laughs> 
All right, I'm gonna show you our last lesson here, um, and then I'm gonna open it up for some questions or comments, and also just share with you if you wanna be in touch with us and learn more about resources. And I will say in the middle here that because we will not be seeing students for quite a while, we're also happy to do guest lessons and teach some of this uh, virtually when the school year starts up again for those of you who might be interested in thinking about that. So it's, please contact us if any of that is appealing to you. All right, so lastly, zooming up here to the very top, I don't know if we have any uh, geography teachers out there. This is not just for you. I wanna say that first off the bat that talking about map projections has a, a, an enormous host of reaches when you're thinking about maps, but those of you who do teach a geography class of some kind probably deal with map projections. But we um, introduce them to students uh, once again as this idea of what kind of map do you use for this purpose. So we're probably all used to seeing a certain kind of map, a world map in our classroom, like a Mercator projection on the wall. Um, and sometimes we think about that map as being very flawed. It's often highlighted as one that only emphasizes Europe and, and North America or at the expense of Africa and the Southern Hemisphere. So I wanna talk just briefly about that. But this lesson deals with these concepts and it is also connected to a part of the exhibition called Squashing the Globe, which has some amazing uh, other additional resources. So I wanna make sure that you look at that if you're interested and I can, if we have time, we'll do that at the end. So what is so great about this lesson is that it starts us off with thinking about the globe, uh, how this is the best, uh, most, most accurate representation of the earth, right? So it gives us these essential elements that we need to kind of understand uh, how land masses look on the earth. So as I scroll down here, um, these are the questions that we're thinking about. What are the differences between maps and globes? What are map projections? How do they show the round earth in different ways? And why might we choose one over the other? And these concepts, if you can see them here, um, shape, size, direction, and distance are what we're thinking about as we talk about maps. How are we maintaining those particular elements? Um, and how, when we start flattening the 3D globe onto 2D surface, do these begin to get distorted in different ways? So we ask students to start kind of playing around with the globe. And what's fun about this online exhibit is there are some interactives here. So we have just a simple globe. We're asking students to look for Africa, to go up and look at Greenland, to take a look at Australia. And these are land masses on a lot of maps that often are extremely distorted or little distorted, but they are usually the ones that you'll notice the most. So to really just kind of absorb what they look like on uh, the globe here. Also thinking about uh, Google Earth as a resource, and there is a link here. And asking students to zoom into Google Earth to kind of play around a little further, look, find, a, find the North Pole, uh, find Antarctica, to pick a location that they wanna zoom around in on. I'm sure a lot of you as educators use Google Earth in a variety of ways. It's great you know, if you're studying Cuba and you want students to zoom into a street view and look at um, what Cuba looks like, this is a great tool. But we really like it because it also, as you zoom in and get down um, into different scales, you can see that there are layers in there. Again, this idea of layers on maps, data layers. So there's labels and other ways that we notice that the, the detail on the map changes a lot as we're zooming in and out on it. So that's one piece of it. Um, the two things here that I think are really effective for talking about projections, one of them is this old school, great illustration of the human head so as you're thinking about your students and how they understand global globe or map projections, the head is a great way to think about that because we all kind of know like how big maybe that nose should be and the proportions of the mouth and things like that, as opposed to land masses, which can sometimes, we've seen so many different maps, it makes more sense to think about it um, as a head. So you can see four different projections here. And then what's even more fun is there's an interactive down here with the same concept. So you can choose a projection. I'm gonna choose one that we may all know, which is Mercator. So as we're talking about Mercator projections and 
the kinds of distortion we see there. We often talk about the poles, right? The North Pole and the South, the Southern Hemisphere here. So we can see that the middle part of the face, the profile here is pretty good, but the chin begins to get elongated. It's got a little bit of a double chin there almost. And then we have a huge neck and a really bulbous head here. So that's where the distortion is happening on the Mercator map. And then you might choose another one. Uh, let's just go with the Van der Grenten. So slightly less distortion, right? Um, but we still have a lot of distortion, certainly at the poles, but maybe a little less than the Mercator. But that particular type of map may not be as effective um, to use for certain things. So it, it just gets us to start thinking about, okay, so where is this distortion? And then asking students to play around with that, but also to think about how what this looks like when we actually get into maps. So the remainder of this lesson is incorporating maps from the Map Center's collection. And there's a link in the lesson to a map set that includes, this is a, a Mercator map. We have um, this Peters map, which was actually a response to the Mercator map. Uh, the distortion here is in the shape, as you may notice on this particular map, we have a really distorted shape of um, certainly Africa and Australia especially. And this lesson deals with those, those particular projections. We ask students to actually either, you could group students around one map, you could have one student at home doing all of the maps, but to rank land masses like Africa, Greenland from one to five, from most accurate to least accurate, and then to cross compare how each of those land masses fares across the map and what did they notice. And then lastly to think about, so, You've looked at these different maps. You looked at these different project projections. Um, is there one that you think, here's our questions here. Is there one you would pick that you were trying to show someone how they might sail around the world in a ship versus one that might show um, someone better how airplanes fly around the world? And is there one that you would select that you think would be particularly great for just teaching? So putting those in the classrooms. Um, and if you had more than one projection, which two would you put together? So that is our projections lesson. And I just want to point out that the section called Squashing the Globe, again, there's our pop-up again. But there is also an addition, you'll see a lot of this throughout the show, uh, links that take you to some really great resources. This is a really campy and fun uh, film called The Impossible Map from 1947 from, from Canada. And the map makers use stop motion to show, uh, to continually cut up a grapefruit using different projections. So it's really a fantastic film and, and, and quite artistic in many ways that also is another way to get kids kind of thinking about projections. Uh, and I believe, yeah, so there's a couple more links down here and there is an additional pop-up down here. Oops, excuse me, I think it was right here. There we go. So instead of the head, we have this one, which is not loading for me at the moment, but this is another type where you can pick from a huge number of different projections. There we go. And it will actually show you the land masses if you want to do compare the heads and the land masses. So those are the big educational elements in the show. Once again, I want to highlight the fact that there's a tremendous amount of content here and it covers a lot of areas. I mentioned earlier, we have, for example, if any of you teach sort of early exploration, we have the John Smith map showing New England where he makes up place names and writes them on top of the indigenous place names that are there, places that actually never came to fruition. So even this idea of, sort of selling, selling through maps exists very early on and especially in this age of exploration. So there are some, could be some great examples if, for those of you who teach history uh, to explore in the show. And there's a lot of maps that are from World War I and World War II, some great serial comic maps that deal with geopolitical um, in Europe from the 19th century as well. And I wanna put up here once again, a link before we get into our questions, just to make a plug that my colleague Lynn and I are available for consultation. If you're looking for resources, if you're looking for maps, we are delighted 
to work with you. We're delighted, of course, those of you who are local when we're having children in the MAP Center, again, delighted to have your children and bring in for a program. But we encourage you to reach out to us. And just for those of you, if you're not linked on, this is the link again to Bending Lines and to our education activities. Um, I have a couple more things, but I wanna just look briefly if we have any comments or questions. I know it seemed to me we maybe we were having a little bit of an issue with one of our comment threads, and I apologize if your comment or question did not get in. Um, so my colleague Lynn says, yes, we can teach you and your students to make your own, absolutely, um, and happy to find maps uh, for you as well. And there was another comment I'm going to say here, a great one. Sorry, we've already gotten to that one as well. So I'm just wondering if there are any other comments or questions or anything else that we could answer for you while we have you here today, as I go and show you a couple more things. All right, I'm gonna show you one quick thing. Lynn had put this into the chat. I'll pull it up here. So we have a evaluative element to bending lines and not just what did you think, but we're really interested to know if you came away with any new ideas about maps and about teaching with maps. If there's something in the exhibition or anything that we touched on today that maybe sparked some thinking or a way that you might integrate maps or mapping in a different way. So we'd love to know more about that. It's actually really helpful to us and our work. I'll put this one up too. Here we go. So we'd love to know more about your thoughts on the session, um, if there are any resources that we can help or provide for you. So the link is here, bit.ly BPL participant. I also wanna make one more plug for an additional program we have. We have one more on Wednesday, June 17th at 1 p.m. So PJ Mode is a map collector. He has a really amazing collection that often are referred to as persuasive maps. It's not a term we use as much, but the name of the talk is Mode on Different Degrees of Deception, but kind of in common parlance, persuasive maps, of which there are many uh, in bending lines. So if you would like to tune into that, you'll learn quite a lot, quite a lot more. And we'll hopefully be having some more events later on, but as in terms of these live sort of weekday events, this is the last one for a little, a little while. All right, I'm gonna go back, here we go. We have one more question. Can you email through the summer? Yes, absolutely. We are on all the time, uh, available anytime that uh, you would like, and we're happy to, again, help provide materials. And if our collection doesn't have it, we know a lot of other collections, Library of Congress, other places, and we have great librarians who can help you out. Um, one last thing, if you go onto, I'll put it up one more time, onto our education site, which is here, our resources for educators. Um, we have information on any upcoming professional development. We also have a teacher fellowship every summer. The deadline has passed, so we do have a cohort of teachers who are all going to be looking at maps and GIS mapping and how they can use it in their high school classrooms. So this is pertaining to thinking about social justice issues, particularly in how mapping can help us understand systems and demographics so if this is something that's of interest to you, we encourage you to apply for next summer. Uh, and again, we are also happy to help you on the side if there's anything like that you would like us to do or to be guest visitors into your classroom. So let me think if there's any more, one last time into our comments, if there's anything else we can do for you. All right, thank you. Some of you joining in today, even if you're not teachers, yay for you. So I wanna say, um, just to thank you all very much for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy day. We um, are here to support you and good job on coming to the end of the school year. If you've been a teacher, we hope that you'll um, reach out to us. So have a good day, everybody. Thanks for joining in. And hopefully you can come visit us at the MAP Center uh, physically in the fall. Take care.